Well, folks, here we are, and uh, apologies for the false signal from <laughs> the countdown system. Um, I have a touchscreen system here that I use to stream at the moment, and it's highly sensitive, and I was actually um, trying to do something and I reset the uh, countdown, so I apologize. Anyway, we are on time. Welcome, welcome, and uh, thanks very much for spending some of your Tuesday evening with us. I have Robbie queued up, ready to come in in just a second. And uh, as with all of these things, um, just to remind you that uh, this isn't uh, financial advice. It's general conversation only. Uh, but feel free to add comments in the chat. Uh, always interested to see what you have to say. And if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to do that. Uh, you can get uh, my attention by using at what the world is part of that. And we also have Super Chat enabled if you'd like to make a contribution to what we do around here or indeed get your question to the top of the list. Um, and just to re-emphasize again, I'm on very basic uh, kit here at the moment. Uh, my studio is still in transit and uh, for another couple of weeks, I'll be uh, waiting for that to arrive. So we are on um, relatively simplistic equipment, but hopefully we can uh, have a good conversation anyway. Now, I have Robbie Barwick uh, teed up and ready to come in. So if uh, Robbie wants to unmute himself, uh, Robbie, how are you doing? Good, Martin. How are you? Yeah, I'm very good. Um, <laughs> I tell you what, the internet connection in here in Australia looks better than it was from Sydney to Melbourne. Work that out. Well, um, not everything about the future is bad. <laughs> 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 some things that some some things are in this Jetson world we live in quite um, quite enjoyable, such as this. Yeah. So look, there's a lot of conversations to to have, Robbie. And um, I was thinking that we might um, try and sort of predicate this around the idea that there are a critical series of decisions ahead, which will determine you know the future of Australia and indeed other countries too. And uh, there are a series of philosophical drivers that are actually driving policy one direction when, in fact, perhaps from a societal perspective, there are alternatives out there. And maybe we could touch a few of those. Uh, you know, we can talk about um, the uh, regional branch, branch closure scheme, because I think that's a very important inquiry that's gone on and banks are now sort of pulling back. Uh, maybe we'll talk about ASIC and the um, cultural norms that are being exposed there and how the uh, Canberra sausage works. But maybe we could also talk about some of the broader issues too in terms of things like, uh, you know, what's going on vis-a-vis -vis, um, China and some of those issues too, because there are a bunch of very significant international geopolitical issues which are also influencing how Australia is behaving and sometimes I think some of those things seem a bit wacky as well. But um, why don't we start with the, uh, your, your pilgrimage to, <laughs> to Queensland and uh, what happened there? Because it was a really important event, wasn't it? Well, it was. But let me preface it by um, uh, teeing off from what you just said there. I, I think um, people need to appreciate that, you know, we are, we are in a systemic global financial crisis and it is global and it is systemic and it's manifesting itself in all kinds of ways, but it's it hasn't just erupted. This has been a, a, um, a long-term uh, breakdown of the financial system that I, mean, I would say that it's been going since um, 2008. We've had, a, we've had an approach to economics and finance that has had its day but because because that approach, which you and I often talk about, you know, we call it neoliberalism, etc. Because that approach made elites filthy rich and gave them incredible powers, including over governments. They don't want to acknowledge that the system, their system, is breaking down, and that's what's making the economy dangerous and the world dangerous in geopolitical terms. There's a real economic driver of what's happening in the world as well. Um, and so that's where we're coming from when we go on the campaigns that we go on um, around um, what might at first seem like a, a small issue, right? Regional bank closures and the, and the need for banking services. But we're trying to actually recruit the public to the need to address the 
the architecture of the financial system that's causing the systemic problem and replace it with architecture that can work for everybody. That's what this campaign is all about. Um, so it is an important issue and more importantly, it's about recruiting the public support for something they can relate to and understand. So from that standpoint, we've been working very hard and, and regular viewers of the show will remember, you know, the updates that we've done. Um, but uh, we got an inquiry uh, back in February and the the specific trigger of the inquiry was the letter that you and, you know, Dale Webster wrote to the, to the Rural and Regional Affairs um, and Transport Committee of the Senate asking for an inquiry. Um, and then Senator Jared Rennie took the lead in getting that up. There was... <laughs> There was a um, there was a, a, a token nay when they vote when they took a vote on it that came from the Labor side, but since then that inquiry has gone gangbusters and it's actually um, uh, it's kicking extraordinary goals, and more importantly, in my view, it's moralising the senators involved, and I think this is crucial. I'm going to give the de- some of the predicates in a minute, but I think this is really crucial because. Um, one of the things that I know from my experience and involvement in politics is you can have all sorts of theories about the they who control the world. And there are they's who try to control the world and exert influence at certain times. One of the big ones at the moment that everyone focuses on is the World Economic Forum, this body that seem, that people fear are dictated to us. But what I know is that the laws that govern us are made in a couple of places, but they're in Australia. They're in Canberra and they're in the States, et cetera. The global stuff has to come through those buildings. They have to be voted on by those elect our people, our elected officials. And those the, where, the, the things that people find really frustrating about politics is when they think, why are these, why are these people, you know, passing such bad stuff all the time? One of the one of the problems is there's a certain con- conditioning, especially in the major parties, of these politicians where they are conditioned to look at things in a certain way. This is what's politically feasible. This is not what's politically feasible, et cetera. And often they won't fight the battles they should fight, which they will win because they've been convinced ahead of time that they won't win, right? So they don't fight them. And therefore... Bad stuff goes through. Bad stuff happens. That's what I mean by the importance of remoralising these politicians. But I'm seeing that happen with the Senate campaign. They have the power over these banks if they choose to assert it, and they never do. Well, in this campaign, they are. In this in this inquiry, they are. And it's it's a it's a joy to me to behold, um, and it's having results. It did. It's it's remarkable how little it's taken. It's it's it's. It's like the bully in the schoolyard. The minute someone stands up to him, he runs away because he's a coward. These banks are turning tail and run, running. Now, granted, CBA hasn't appeared yet, so we haven't been able to test its metal. NAB did appear, but I think they sent um, the T-1000 from Terminator along with, with um, uh, ice in her veins or whatever. This, this That person was like a robot. You know, She wasn't phased by this process. But Westpac absolutely was, and ANZ, I suspect, from what I saw in the on the, in the EM hearing, uh, was as well. And this is, yeah, this is uh, this is something. And I think because of that, because the the, the politicians are moralised, they will keep going after these banks, including including and, and not take crap from NAB and not take crap from CBA, etc. So, bottom line, though, let me let me just give you some predicates. Um, uh, we got the. We got the um, one of the biggest banks in Australia, Westpac, you know, the old bank in New South Wales, um, the oldest bank in Australia, to back down and keep eight branches open. And that was a real victory. But it has a knock-on effect because Westpac essentially said, I kid you not, we didn't like the first hearing. Um, that was too much pressure on us. We didn't, We couldn't handle that scrutiny. We don't want to come to the second hearing. Keep your branches then. <laughs> Right, they had eight branches they were going to close in order to buy to buy out of having to appear at the hearing. They 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 said keep your branch. We're going to keep the branches open, and it was that shameless, and and literally it was because the Senate 
the committee said, okay, well, because Westpac said we don't want to come to the hearing. We've said it. We've told you everything we're going to say. And, and the Senate said, well, no, you've been told to come to the hearing. We want you to come. And Westpac's comeback was, well, we're keeping the branches open. And then Matt Canavan said, well, he thought about it and thought, well, okay, um, on that, on that, in that case, on that condition, all right, we'll we'll withdraw the offer. So technically, Westpac wasn't in defiance of the hearing. Now, so they got out of attending a hearing and going through the grilling again that they got in sale in, in March. So they got out of that. That was that was good for them. They thought, but how can they so easily? turn around and keep eight branches open that a week before were unviable and were having to be closed. And and by the way, Martin, they had had they had advanced plans to close them. They had they had um you know told informed landlords and what this is what they said anyway. I don't know if they, they might own the in some cases own the own the buildings, but they'd inform landlords, they'd inform staff, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, that you know that these jobs would be gone and whatnot. Um flick the click of the fingers they're staying open and they're suddenly viable. And so I think by intimidating them, because these senators stood up to them, by intimidating them into this backflip, they've not only shown something about their decision-making and how their their branch closures program has been unjustified, not just for these eight, but for all most almost all branches, and I would say all branches, but they've probably shown that for the other banks as well, right? And so now the senators have their blood up because it's like, okay, if this is so if, if if this is so easy to do, then what about the rest of you guys as well, right? And so this is gonna this is really showing the banks and how they really operate. Um, uh, Matt Canavan, the chairman of the inquiry, and I think this is quite significant, and and I like I like this kind of feedback, especially and sharing it in a forum like this because. Um, for those people who are your regular viewers, like our regular viewers who actually participate in this campaign and help get up the inquiry, this is your this is a result of what you did, right? Own own this. Matt Canavan said that now he's the chair. He said this is the already, and it's only been going a few months. This is already the most successful Senate inquiry he has ever participated in. And he's been a senator there for over a decade. He's participated in lots of inquiries. This is the most successful, both in terms of public engagement and in terms of outcomes. And that's a, that's you know that's that's a real testament um, uh, to the process. Um, the, the the quotable quote I reckon uh, comes from Clon Curry. So what happened was last uh, last week I had to fly from Melbourne to Brisbane, Brisbane to Mount Mount Isa. Mount Isa to, I drove from Mount Isa to Cloncurry for the hearing and back to Mount Isa, then flew from Mount Isa to Townsville, drove from Townsville to Ingham and back to Townsville, and then Townsville back to Brisbane, Brisbane to Sydney, Sydney to Melbourne. So I took six flights last week. Um, and, and the office is making fun of me because I know I actually, I, I genuinely hate traveling, but anyway, I wasn't going to miss this. It's too good. Um, uh, the town of Cloncurry, I think this is, it was unique circumstances. Cloncurry, if you get if you drive through it, you think, okay, yeah, this is like, you know, this is like a because it's remote in remote Queensland, it's a large country town, but by the standards of say a built up state like New South Wales or Victoria, it'll be a smallish, smallish country town, right? Um, and you think, okay, yeah, these are the this is a sort of town that banks branches are being closed in, but. The circumstance of this town is somewhat unique. They have five of the biggest private cattle barons in Australia are based in this town. Five of them, including this guy who testified, Don Don um, uh, McDonald from the McDonald McDonald Holdings. He's known as Don McMillions, apparently. He's probably a billionaire. There's between the cattle industry and the mining industry. There's billions of dollars, literally billions of dollars in the Westpac branch at Cloncurry, billions. And so these people, like this, this cattle baron and and the, and all the, you know, the, um, the, the council that represents Cloncurry, the Cloncurry Council and the Mayor, they, they're representing people who are in these industries. They know the worth of their town. 
They know the value of the local economy. And on top of what's already there, there's all these new developments. One of the biggest uh, potash, uh, sorry, phosphate mines in the world is in near Cloncurry and it's expanding. Um, there's a big there's a big infrastructure project called uh, uh, Copper String 2.0 that the state government has committed to building that's going to be going through Cloncurry. And so all these guys could think was, hang on, you banks are the financial and business genius. It's a town that's got all this wealth, all this activity. This, this is the quote, this makes no business sense whatsoever. Now, I don't know, you know, you know banks better than I do, Martin, but you know, they're very, these big four are very big. They're huge, unwieldy bureaucracies in their own right. So what the, when they got the blowback, Westpac sent a, some top executives, top guys into Cloncurry to talk to the locals because they realised that they had pissed off some very, very, very big business customers, really pissed them off because even though they're huge business customers, especially these cattle barons, they're family business customers. Right, this is their town. They live there. They're not. They're not London pastoral companies dictating to us to Australia on the other side of the world. Right, this is their town, and they're being told, "Oh, you're not going to have a bank anymore." It's like, hang on. And they're successful business guys. So Westpac had to send these top guys. They blame the decision on lower downs, and I'm not buying that at all. But the mayor seemed to be. But anyway, that's, that's his business. I'm not buying that at all. Um, what they would, what they're actually doing is responding to the blowback they got. The executive that they sent up there said, "Oh boy, I had no idea how how um how how good the economy is going around here. How you know all all the all the potential there is here." And you're thinking, "Hello, you got no idea. You're the bank. You're supposed to have you think you know your your um your, your feelers out. Your your uh your ear to the ground. You know how how do you banks run successful businesses if you're not actually aware of what's happening in the economy you're supposedly serving, right? But anyway, all this sort of stuff is coming out." And so they realised they had no choice but to reverse that decision um, for Clon Curry, no choice at all. And but by but by um, by the way it came about, and the fact that these top successful business guys in agribusiness and and mining were saying, "Hang on, this makes no business sense whatsoever." Now there's a big question mark over the way banks make decisions, and there's two alternative explanations: either these big banks who hold the fate of Australia's economy in their hands because our government has let them hold the fate of the Australian economy in their hands. Our government has vacated all responsibility for the actual investments in the economy to these big four bastard banks. That's why we have a housing bubble facilitated by the RBA, right? These big banks, they're either supremely effing incompetent and that should goddamn terrify everybody or they have an agenda. And I think that's the bigger issue that we have to get these people to arrive at. They in this, this proves, because they're not that incompetent, although there's bureaucratic bullshit in there. This case of Clon Curry and the way Westpac's handle it proves that they are forcing us to conform to their agenda. Their agenda is this digital goddamn dystopia to hell with the consequences. And they thought they'd get away with it because there was no organised resistance, because the pathetic, supremely pathetic National Party a year earlier had done this regional banking task force and effectively rubber-stamped the whole damn thing. And then Dale Webster, Martin North and Robbie Barrett came along and said, no, and we've turned the whole thing on its head, thanks to the support of people on this channel. So this is a really big deal. This is not a small issue. This is not a small campaign. This is a big deal. We have, we have ripped the mask off one of the big four banks and the, what the truth that lies behind it lies behind all four of them and they're all their masks are going to be ripped off. And the, the politicians, the most important thing, as I'll repeat, the politicians involved in the process are really getting motivated by this, right? And I know this is going to continue. They want more scalps. In the, in the Ingham hearing the next day, because you didn't have a big four at Cloncurry because Westpac wouldn't come the, the, the big four bank that came to Ingham was ANZ, and this was its first appearance. And I'm watching the senators, and they all sit up straighter. They roll up their sleeves effectively. They get a gleam in their eye, and they went for it. And Matt, Matt um, Canavan ended that 
um, session with Ingham, uh, with ANZ, he hectored them. He gave them a dressing down, right? And, you know, that this, this, this whole, this, this obsequious to banks from politicians, among this group at least, we've broken it. They want accountability. And that's, you know, that's the most important thing that I think that's coming out of this. Yeah, Robbie, absolutely. And uh, I will say, <laughs> uh, I had your volume down a little bit early on because uh, I knew you'd get a little fired up. And a couple of people said, hey, Robbie's a bit quiet. So I turn your volume up. <laughs> And then you. Well, not, I can't. I can't see the comments as I'm as I'm um, uh, as I'm going. So no, 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 no. That's, that's I wasn't, absolutely. Fine. I wasn't that's responding to anyone. <laughs> absolutely fine. But the, the the point about this is that this is a really radical thing that's going on. Insofar that the Senate has finally got an issue that they see that they can actually make change on. And yep. interestingly, of course, if you talk about the, you know, the, the, the major support within the government and probably the opposition, most of those would be aligned with the big banks. And yet here we have a Senate inquiry picking the top off what's going on and you're seeing all of the rubbish all the, the poor decisions, everything else that's actually driven the banks. And, you know, one of the things I keep saying, Robbie, is their accounting systems and the way they actually allocate profit to one part of the business and costs to the branches means that they can claim that branches are loss leading when in fact branches yep. are real profit centers. Yep. <laughs> there's, there's a there's a very there's a prop there's a there's a there's a branch in Cloncurry that is bulging at the seams with how much money it makes thanks to these agribusinesses. Oh, no, they look, this was supreme stupidity combined with you know that exposed they had an agenda. The co the, the the council now I'll just I'll just give some background. You as long as Martin and I have been talking about branch closures as an issue, um you, Martin, remember, you've been telling me at this point you just made, right? You, because you understand the accounting side of it, that the banks are, are cooking the books here, um, transferring transferring profitable accounts to larger centres and making the um, the uh, the the smaller the smaller branches look um, unprofitable. The Con Curry Council's submission to the ta to the inquiry made that point twice, and they said. The, the one recommendation in that submission was there should be some kind of rule against banks being allowed to do that because they saw that was about to be done to their town. And these are people who go, we know what's in this town. Um, and, I, you know, I wish all all towns had the same kind of um, really well-organised, you know, bigger business types who could go in and, and protect the town. problem is most bigger businesses are corporations and don't give a stuff about the towns they're in. When you, when you have a unique circumstance where the big business is a family business, right, is an actual um, owned by a, a, an individual or a family, and they live in that town, they act differently. June E, if, um, where we did really good work in June E um, in New South Wales that fought the closure of CBA there, um, they had the assistance of the, the chocolate factory, which is a pretty big business in that town, owned by, you know, it's a, it's a big family business in that town, and that's an example of it. Um, in Cloncurry, they had a bunch of those, and 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 the the money they make is so big that it couldn't be ignored. And now, and now that's that's um that's exposed for all the world to see this sleight of hand that the banks have um uh, uh as a standard practice. Um, hopefully, the rest of these towns that are that are being told they're going to you know they're going to lose their branches, people look at that and go. Well, hang on. You're not going to get away with doing that with us, right? Um. Yeah, and Robert, the other thing to say, and you mentioned earlier on about their agenda. Now, obviously, their agenda is to try and drive profitability for shareholders, but also impose a digital future where effectively you are forced to transact within their systems and processes 
And of course, never mind the fact that in regional areas, digital is a real problem. Quite often people can't actually get connections and those sorts of things. Um, but it's clear to me that their idea is that once you're in the digital system, then they clip the ticket on the way through. So there's a certain revenue stream into the future. And what it does is essentially uh, mean that they prescribe the way that we transact, yep. use cash, yep. not use cash, those sorts of things. And I find it fascinating to think that they are relying on the establishment of the MBN and other digital services. In other words, everybody else pays for these connectivity costs, not the banks. So well, there is a big agenda here. And then, of course, well, if you West take Pack, it... Go on. No, Westpac, in their sheer arrogance, was part... All, all four banks were in this um, article in the Financial Review a couple of weeks before the hearing. And the article was, and it was written by James Ayres, who's a journalist of, I know, um, and they were bragging that we're going cashless. And Westpac had specifically said that um, the the solution to country town security from having a lot of cash, because they, 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 they talked about the scenario of, say, a, a town horse race or something, a major, you know, one of the major annual events of the town, and people come from all around, and a lot of people in the town, there's a lot of cash changing hands. But because there's no bank, then this cash becomes a security risk and it's got to, you know, you've got to drive a long way to take it to the bank. And Westpac said, the solution to that is make the town entirely cashless. Then there's no security risk. And this is what this guy was saying in this Fin Review Forum with the with the other with the executives of the other big four banks. And first of all, the reason there's a security risk is because it's Westpac who's closed the damn branch. <laughs> Right, they just just as if everything they do is justified. They create the security risk by closing the branch in the first place. Second of all, um, who's paying for this infrastructure to make this possible? Because they're actually, they're not the banks are not lining up to volunteer to roll out five G and NBN all around Australia. They're not doing. The only way you would make that work is to do that. But I use as an example on our show. When um, they, they're just piggybacking off the existing, you know, mobile te tower infrastructure, Don McDonald, the the billionaire cattle baron, um, told the story that he once had to do his payroll in his helicopter, hovering close to the tower to get better reception. So that's one solution for regional Australia. Everyone get a helicopter and become a billionaire, and and you know do that. Um, it, but in all practicality, no Westpac and the banks they just they're just freeloading off the public. They expect the government to roll out all this infrastructure. And even when it is rolled out, if you went to the, um, uh, they, had a, they had that really, really big freedom slash um, anti-vaccine protest in front of parliament back in January, I think it was, 2022. And every second person was trying to live stream it, Martin, and none of the live streaming worked because when everyone's trying to use the internet at once, the, the Wi-Fi, Right, the bandwidth just collapsed. It can't handle it, and that's what happens in these country races. Everyone, if if Westpac thinks that everyone will have a little tap machine, right, dialing up to the um to the internet all the time, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. They're just freeloaders, these people. Um, and you know, you just see the kind of the, the kind of thinking they've they've got because they've decided this class, this cashless thing is so good for them. The reason I knew that that, that um. That's their motivation, and there's a couple of aspects to it. But the, the motivation is is um, definitely that because they can they can gouge more profits um, by going down this path. Because that's in in our time, the nature of banking has changed. The original nature of banking, and banks were probably never saints or anything, but originally the the bank made its money by helping you make your money. That's how, you know, they loan to you so you could buy a house which you needed or you or they loan to your business. Business lending used to be all, traditionally bigger than mortgage lending for banks. They loan to your business. They help you make money. They get a cut of that. Banks decided, um, along with privatisation, in fact, um, uh, David Murray, 
the guy who presided over the Commonwealth Bank when it was privatised, he brought in this model to Australia. Adele Ferguson documents it really well in Banking Bad in her book about the Royal Commission. They brought in the clip the ticket model, right? You could you'll make you you could make money that way, and they still claim they do, but they make a lot more money by clipping the ticket. You put fees on everything. You take a cut of everything. Suddenly your customers are there to be fleeced. That's how you make your money. And you go digital, you can fleece everyone on steroids. That's what they're thinking. So they get all our data. They get to monetize that data. They get to um, uh, predict our behavior with that data. And then they get a cut of every transaction. And at first, they'll, they'll program it to, you know, a fraction of a cent or a few cents or whatever. And then the more they have the market and the more the big, you know, if, if, I, if we ever have a digital dystopia where you have the same makeup, the big four, 80% plus of the Australian banking market, everyone uses them, everyone's effectively digital, that cut will not stay as five cents. It'll be 10 cents, 50 cents, whatever. They will, they will take a bigger and bigger cut and they will collude with each other on like the way because there's no competition already, right? That's what they want. They've got dollar signs in their eyes. Plus, um, the banks are working in tandem with governments here, and this is the this is the more dystopian side of it, which is which people from a civil liberty standpoint really need to guard against. Um, you know, the banks the banks uh, see that this kind of control. Um, over our finances is a means of public control. Governments see that as well, right? And it was an issue. We've seen it work. We've we've seen we've seen it in practice um, it, with the Ontario uh, truckers protest um, in Canada, where the government decided they didn't like that protest, so they cut off their money. Right? That's a means of control. And so, if you have this relationship, like we've got. Um, between the government structure and the big banks, et cetera, and they can herd us into this, these digital pens, um, they will use it, right? Don't kid yourself. They will use it. Now, here's the good news, though. A lot of people haven't thought this through. The people who have thought it through oppose it. And a fascinating thing happened a few weeks ago in Brussels. And Brussels is the headquarters of the European Union. And... Um, Brett Scott, who is the author of a book that I've mentioned on our shows a few times, named Cloud Money, he was part of a debate. So they had the Brussels Economic Forum of the European Union, about, I think it was about three weeks ago. And this is the elite of the European Union. These are the people who tend to go along with this stuff. In fact, these are the people who tend to pioneer these things. The European Union is actually, right now, the European Union as, a, as, the, as the body is trying to bring in a, in a cash ban, a cash transaction ban. Right, ten thousand euro, I think, cash transaction ban. The very thing that we that we stopped in in twenty nineteen. Citizens Party, you know, you you John Adams and the coalition we were able to build around that one nation, etc. Um, uh, so this was a topical discussion. So they took it. They had a debate on Oxford Rules at the Brussels Economic Forum you know, about three weeks ago, and so the way the Oxford Rules work work is they have a vote at the beginning. And a vote at the end. And the motion was um, a cashless society will be good for individuals and the economy. That's what the motion was. So they took a vote at the beginning. And even the elite of the European Union at this Brussels Economic Forum, in the ori original vote, um, voted against it 58 to 42. So that was, you know, a decent majority against that proposition. They were already uncomfortable with it. That kind of motion. A cashless society is good for the people and the economy. They took the half hour, they had the half hour debate. Brett Scott from Cloud Money, because I know his book, he gave his arguments and he makes these really elegant arguments about how cash should not be considered um, old technology that's been superseded. He compares it to a bicycle, right? Not, not the horse and cart. The horse and cart is to old technology that's been superseded, but there's still plenty of bicycle riders around because it performs a function. It has a service. It should always be considered. He has this really good little metaphor like that. And the other point he makes is 
when you are using your card or your phone or whatever, every transaction, you don't know this, but you're asking the bank's permission to do that. And it's programmed that you will usually get that permission, but it can be programmed that you won't one day, right? There, that is a vulnerability to you. You're not using your money. You're using the bank's money. Outside of bank money, there's only there's the only other type of money is state money, he calls it, which is basically legal tender, the government's money that we, our government, right? And that exists in the form of central bank reserves and printed cash. And the only way citizens have the, the only off-ramps citizens have outside to, to leave the banking system and not be subjected. Now, there's a reason to be part of the banking system. That's why we're trying to say bank branches. But you don't want to be totally dependent on the banking system. And the only off-ramp is branches and ATMs where you can get cash because the cash in your hand is purely sovereign. That's your money, right, your ownership of state legal tender to do with as you will. So he explained all this. When they took the vote at the end of the half-hour debate, the outcome was was amazing. 72% against the motion, 28% in favour of it. And the host of the debate was like, oh, wow. Even by their standards, that was a big shift once people had heard the issues. And that's why we've got to have these campaigns because we're educating the public as we're going along so that people can actually fight this stuff. Because I went crazy on Twitter today. Um, <laughs> there was a young lady, uh, ABC journalist, wrote an article on the ABC yesterday about this new uh, social media trend called uh, wallet stuffing, uh, envelope stuffing, and anyway, cash stuffing, I think it's called. Some of you... I'm sure someone making comments will correct me. Cash stuffing. And it's and it's it's become a trend, which is really interesting in among young people on social media. A billion, like there's a the main video promoting this has a billion views or whatever, or the videos promoting this have a billion views, where they're saying, look, if you really want to save money, use cash. And so they 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 encourage young people to to take the take your wages out fully of the bank in cash. Put it in envelopes marked with your main expense items, et cetera, et cetera. And so this young ABC journo tried to do it. And she admitted that she saved money. She actually admitted that. She also admitted that she avoided um, transaction fees. But the two bad things about the article, she said, and this is a, I don't know how old she is, um, Rachel Rasker, I think her name is. She said that she found it really difficult including when she went to spend the cash because she only made herself, she was only allowed to spend cash. She felt like a criminal trying to pay $20 in cash for a cup of coffee because she's so conditioned to think that everything is um, uh, wireless and, and online and, and digital now that, you know, there's no need for cash unless you've got some other thing. That's how bad this agenda has gone um, that's how far down this a bad path this agenda has gone, Martin. She felt like a criminal. This is like that's conditioning, right? And then the other thing is she said, she um, yes, I saved money, but I hated it because I hated the inconvenience. That was her conclusion. Well, you know, um, they're the people we've got to reach because <laughs> because one day she might think she she needs to save money and then realize that it's not really inconvenience. And hell, why should anyone? feel like a criminal for wanting to spend cash, right? We we have a bit of work to do to, to um, drag the I, and I'll just say, Robbie, this um, envelope stuffing, it's basic budgeting. That's all it is. Yeah, right? that's what it and, is. and they're using cash as effectively a control mechanism so you just don't sort of spend, spend, spend. And that's so actually an important it. point because in the digital world, it's so easy to just... Tap and spend, tap and spend, tap and spend, right? What this yep. is doing is bringing a little bit of friction back into the whole transaction process, which actually is good discipline from the point of view of financial planning and, and budgeting. And also, if you think about it from an individual perspective, um, you know, you can make better choices. But of course, 
all those big corporations, they just want you to spend, spend, spend and don't think about it and, you know, use buy now, pay later and those other tools to expand your spend capacity. Why? Because it benefits them rather than the individuals. And it comes back to this fundamental point that you need to actually understand what the true game here is, right? And that's why this envelope stuffing thing is a really important example of a different way of thinking, which is, I think, worth pursuing. I think it's really great. Uh, the, the irony of a social media trend in the digital world, bringing cash back among young people, <laughs> right getting them out of the digital world financially i think it's just wonderful um and and but you know what's made it popular martin is just the reality of the economic the dire economic circumstances they live in uh cost of living total inability to to to, to afford housing right they, they're you know young people at a certain point realize if i'm ever, ever going to buy a house i've got to, got to save up for it and that's what that's actually what's driving this um and you know this is back to my rant about the the model of the banks changing you know the this is uh the, the banks are still trading on a reputation they don't deserve because people still assume that the banks are making sound decisions right and they're not this this new model is not about sound decisions now we already know that from all the discussions we've had about the housing bubble and and all the and all the bad banking lending practices that led to the Royal Commission. The the idea of sound like people people got into these bad debts because they accepted that their idea was well if the bank's willing to lend me this money it must be legit because they are the bank, right? Now a friend of mine who's a a financial expert lecturer at QUT, his he I've read his submission to this Royal Commission to this inquiry. He he's he's got some great anecdotes in there. And he tells how back in the um back when he was younger, living on the Darling Downs, he lived in a town of uh three thousand people, and there were two thousand people in the district, and they had six banks in the town. Six banks were profitable in a in a district of five thousand people. This all this profitable stuff is all garbage, utter garbage. So that was one case. The bank manager was a steward of the town. He wanted to borrow money to buy land, and the bank manager said, "Look, he didn't. He didn't say he wouldn't lend him money, but he advised him against it." That bank manager forewent a loan that would make money for the bank because he said, "Look, the property market is too hot around here. It will crash. It will correct in about eighteen months." That's what he's like back in the day. His local bank manager predicted, and he advised him against borrowing to buy land, and he was right. So not only was that manager taking responsibility for that for my friend's welfare he was taking responsibility for the welfare of the district he didn't want to feed this overheated property market land market back there that's it that would never happen today ever right these we we are, these guys who are running this show are actual predators and so when these young people are just flashing their cards and phones everywhere and tap 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 and they think it must be okay. No, the bank is the equivalent of a heroin pusher. That's the moral responsibility the bank is taking towards Australians and towards young people, the equivalent of the heroin, heroin pusher, the equivalent of the East India Company deciding the only way we're going to get enough silver to be able to continue buying tea off China is if we can get the people of China addicted to opium. And that is what they did. And that's why we're having that. That's that is the root cause of the war with China we're talking about today. By the way, anyway, we'll get onto that later. But that is exactly what the biggest corporation in the history of the world ever did. They said we are we we know opium is poisonous. We know it's bad for people. It's it's banned in, in England, but we are deliberately going to get the people of China addicted to it because that's good for our profit. And nothing has changed in the mentality of some of people in corporations. And it's even worse now, and the, the banks have the equivalent of heroin dealers when it comes to the way they're, they're treating the public. We need a total overhaul, which is why we have a solution, Martin. Absolutely. Well, let me just um, touch on what you've just said, because one of the things that I get from when I talk with people quite often is, um, you know, surely the banks know what they're doing you know they're lending money left right and center surely that's okay because um they are 
they have made an assessment and they know what I can afford. Well, what's interesting, of course, is that those assessments were made on a bunch of assumptions about where interest rates were going and all of those things. And they also have made an assumption about the fact that, well, if people got into financial difficulty, they'd stop spending elsewhere because they'd always pay the mortgage or they'd always repay the credit card, yeah. right? There's a set of philosophical assumptions that banks have made which are actually not aligned with the interests of the consumers that actually are often taking credit. And, and one of the big things that, um, you know, Scott Moe and a few other people uh, was talking about was caveat emptor, you know, let the bar beware. Well, the fact is you can't rely on the bank to do your financial planning for you because their interests and your interests are not aligned. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny you said that. So... Uh, our mutual friend John Adams and I often have arguments and people have heard us argue on um, this show. Um, <clears throat> but not that long ago, John John was reading a book on the Opium War. I've mentioned the Opium War before. And this was a scandal in the UK because there was um, uh, the East India Company was a monopoly. And so there was two aspects to the, scan the growing political scandal in the UK at the time of the Opium War. One was we are actually addicting the Chinese to opium, something that we know is bad, how can we do that? And two, why we believe in free trade and the free market. Why are we allowing a, a monopoly to do this, right? And um, one of, the, one, one of the, the, the truths about economics, modern, especially liberal economics, is all a fraud. It's all, the whole thing's a damn scam because the great um, uh, uh, John Stuart Mill and James Mill, his father, were both employees of the East India Company, and they were the big economists of the free market. But when this scandal erupted, James Mill went to Parliament and testified in defence of the East India Company being a monopoly, his employer being a monopoly, even though he believed in the free market, supposedly. And when he was challenged about the opium being poisonous, why, they, why are we allowing a monopoly British company to addict people to poison? His answer was caveat emptor. It's all on the responsibility of the buyer, not the seller. Now, that is the that is a, a historical example of the evil of this philosophy. And as I've said before, I believe caveat emptor is a perfectly wonderful philosophy for people to personally live their lives by, but it should not be a doctrine of regulation or law because you must hold those corporations to account and people do not know appreciate especially in a country like australia where we're such a nanny state in many many ways and we were talking about this today because we're we're, we're con we've got a jan pakalis is a citizens party candidate for um the seat the, the seat of fadden in the by-election up there in, in the gold coast and um we were told that you can't, there's a law now, you can't have a sign on a car that's stationary. I mean, they, they, they come up with all kinds of nanny state laws in Australia. There's no end to them. <laughs> um, Australians know that all, every, they assume every part of our life is highly regulated because it is. And so when they're in the financial system, they assume that's highly regulated too. And it's not. It is lawless by comparison, governed by the law of the jungle, let the buyer beware, and people keep getting devoured, right? And yeah, do you cannot, we, we really have to, this is a public service warning to the public. Do not um, uh, kid yourself that your bank has your best interest at heart because there's no, there's nothing in law that's demanding they do that. And, and you know, the, the senators um, in this inquiry, they're, you know, this is a sort of, these are the sort of discussions that are coming out. The, the Labor Party senator in the Ingham hearing, Linda White, Senator Linda White for Victoria, she did a really good job putting ANZ on the spot, um, including about the banking code of practice. And that's what that's what regulation, that's the regulation that exists in Australia. APRA, APRA tweaks a few things to do with their capital requirements and then otherwise they have a banking code of practice. That's, re that's voluntary. It's a voluntary code of practice. It's not enforceable. It's a joke. 
yet that's what the public are all exposed to. Yeah, yeah. Really. and sorry, just on that, of course, the point is that um, caveat emptor might work if you had equal understanding and equal access to data and everything else, right? But we have this unequal relationship between banks and, and their customers where basically the banks hold all the cards and the customers, well, you know, where are they? I remember years ago seeing this uh, very funny comedy sketch where the branch manager was up on his big seat and he was looking over the desk down at this little customer who was pleading for money, right? And that's actually the unequal relationship that I think we actually have with, with, with the banks because they hold all the cards. Um, they don't disclose many of the things which are going on below the waterline in terms of what uh, determines their decisions. And, of course, they're driven by profitability. And going back to the Royal Commission into the financial services, the key finding that came out of that was that profit drives everything. And the culture yep. driven top down by those organizations through the senior executives were to maximize profit at all costs, irrespective of the social uh, responsibility, accountability, and uh, consequences. And, and that's why we've got to find a different banking model to take Australia and other countries forward. Yeah, and so um, it, I, I'm, I firmly believe this is a case where you don't have to reinvent the wheel because um, uh, we see the financial system as one that was evolving in a certain way towards better and, and improved practices um, over, over centuries. Um, and that, by the time of World War II, that included a really important role for public banks. Public banks were very, very central to um, successful economies around the world. And we've done a lot of work on this, a lot of research. So you had... Um, uh, in America, the main public bank was not the Federal Reserve. It was because that's actually not a public bank anyway. But it was it was a bank that Franklin Roosevelt set up. He didn't set it up. He, he it was actually set up to rescue the private banks by um, Hoover. It was called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. But um, when Roosevelt got elected, because it was already capitalized, he just used that as a public bank for a massive investment program. And that it was that investment program that transformed. The United States into the productive powerhouse it became through major projects like the Tennessee Valley Authority and the Grand Coulee Dam and all these sort of things. Um, got people into jobs in the Depression. The things that we weren't allowed to do in the Depression in Australia, they did it in the United States with that. Um, in Australia, we've talked about this, this new RBA review that wants to undo this, get rid of this power that the Treasurer has to overrule the, rule, the, the um, decisions of the RBA. That came out of the fight in Australia in the 1930s depression about um, using the Commonwealth Bank because the Treasurer told the Commonwealth Bank, invest in farmers, invest in public works, and the Commonwealth Bank refused to do that, refused to follow the Treasurer's order. And so that led to this rule later on. Um, so it wasn't done in the Great Depression here, but it was done in World War II. And it was done spectacularly in World War II. The role of the Commonwealth Bank in World War II and the economic miracle, um, the, the miraculous economic mobilisation that Australia had in World War II was extraordinary. Um, uh, immediately post-war, Clement Attlee, the UK Prime Minister, he nationalised the Bank of England. The Bank of England had been going since 1694. Um, it was a syndicate of the City of London. It was a privately owned central bank. Um, it was sort of like the, it, it set the model for the world and it oper operated that way for uh, two and a half centuries or whatever it was. Um, and... and um, uh, Atlee nationalised it and made it a, a government-owned bank um, for the UK because this was accepted as this is what's got to happen. Um, now, for the for Australia, <clears throat> although when Menzies took over the Labor Party from the Labor the Chifley government, he wasn't he was really close to the Collins Street bankers in Melbourne, and he and they didn't like the Commonwealth Bank, but he knew he couldn't get rid of it, so he weakened it somewhat. He split off the Reserve Bank from it. But they still had 
um, especially the National Party in those days or the Country Party, Arthur Fadden and, and Black Jack McEwen, they insisted, no, no, we need this public bank that can play a role in the industrial development of Australia. And so the Commonwealth Bank did that. It had a, it had a division called the Commonwealth Development Bank. And this is the function it provided all up until 1996. And so all those years from when the Commonwealth Bank was started in 1912 to 1996, the private banks of Australia had to compete with a very good, very successful public option. And what we've had since 1996 is none of that. The, the Campbell report in 1982 demanded that all public banks in Australia be privatised, and they were, and there's, ne there's now no public option at all. So look at the results. It's 25 years later. Look, the results are there. The verdict is in. It's been a disaster from, you know, you've got, you got banks that are addicted to a property bubble. You've got banks that don't lend, that, that by proportionally, they don't lend to business and small business like they used to, et cetera. The productive side of the economy gets starved, actually starved of credit. Um, so you end up having an economy based on something that's undeniably successful, which is mining, but also the trickle, the supposedly trickle down or wealth effect of the, the property bubble. Um, and this is what the this is this was what I was ranting about earlier. With you know the governments vacated the field and left the the economic well being of Australia up to the profit motivated decisions of the banks, these private banks. So you can bring in regulations to address some of this. Um, and you can you can bring in some successful regulations, and of course one of the successful regulations that um, you know you uh, you Martin and we in the Citizens Party have campaigned for for a long time is Glass Steagall, right? Se separate out the the banks that hold customer deposits from investment banks, so there's no role for speculation um, in the real economy. Right to 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 act like a a parasite to to drain wealth out of the real economy. That's an that's a very very important um, uh, policy to actually do that. So we could do those sort of and and that's an easy regulation to enforce, by the way. And that's one of the reasons they got got rid of it. It was really successful in America when they had it. So we can do that. Um, if, if you try and go too far down the path of finicky little regulations, though, the banks will always be looking for ways around that. Um, there was a member of the House of Lords in the UK 10 years ago who had this memorable quote. Um, he said he was a former City of London banker himself. He said, investment bankers are extremely adept at finding a way between the wallpaper and the wall, <laughs> right? So doesn't mean you shouldn't have those rules, but you've got to understand that they're always going to be trying to game those rules. But one of the single most effective things you can do to force the st real standards on the private banks is force them to compete with a public bank again. That, and I've had bankers tell me that. Our mutual friend John Dalson was the first person to ever tell me um, that he said we should be looking at a postal bank because he was a former ANZ director, disgusted with where with 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 um, the direction it all went to. He said. You got to make them compete with a public bank, and other people have have um, uh, given similar feedback. People in the big end of town, um, and that's what that's a, that's a, a, a really effective policy and an achievable policy that we can get up right, so that it'll it'll have also it'll it'll be competitive pressure for good standards, but. In terms of the, the campaign we've been on for regional banking services, it'll be competitive pressure for good services, proper, just basic services, right? If right now the banks are exploiting the taxpayers who own Australia Post and exploiting the small business people who run the most post offices as licensed post offices um, by pulling out of towns and saying, you can still bank with us through the post office and they're not even paying properly to, re to cover Australia Post and the LPO's expenses for doing that, and they're getting it, they're being allowed to get away with it, and and they just assume we can pull out of town and we'll keep our customers through the post office. What if they knew if they pull out of town, they're going to lose their customers because those customers will go to bank 
not through the post office, but with the post office, with a post office bank, right? Um, and it'll be a totally different uh, calculus for the banks to realise, ah, oh, if we start, what, what are we going to do? Lose all our customers in regional Australia, right? And then, and then not just all them because this will become a popular idea. By the way, because it's a government-owned bank that we're advocating, you know, forget forget the two hundred fifty thousand dollar deposit guarantee, which is not even funded. Your deposit will be one hundred percent guaranteed because you'll only lose it if the government goes broke. And if the government ever goes broke, well, your, your money in the bank is probably the least of your problems. <laughs> it, it'll be it'll be um, it'll be chaos. You know, that's a really uh, uh, extremely unusual circumstance. Um, yeah, people will looking for that kind of security and, and strength, especially in times of increasing financial crisis, they'll gravitate towards this bank. And the big banks will have to go, whoa, you know, so uh, we're not going to get away anymore with as soon as the RBA raises rates, we jack ours up straight away, but we take forever to raise the deposit, the rate on deposits. We're not going to get away with that anymore. We're going to have to hustle to attract people. We're going to have to treat them nicely. We're going to have to stop fleecing them. We're going to have to stop making them go broke, right? We're going to have to stop ripping them off. That's what happens when they have when there's a, a good, sound, viable option owned by the government that the public can bank with. And then, and of course, the government can use that bank to fund things that benefit the people of Australia. You, you direct loans back into small businesses in the regions. You can get you can get money circulating in the regions. Robbie Catter, the state MP for Queensland, is Bob Catter's son. His submission to the regional banking inquiry is all about how badly starved of credit um, regional and remote Australia actually is. And that's why no one, it's they're losing all sorts of services because they're losing the economy of, sort of scales. They, the, the areas are depopulating. And it starts with the banks not being prepared to lend money in there. You get money circulating again, the, the public will follow the money because there'll be opportunities, small businesses will work out, et cetera. And it'll be a it'll be a growing spiraling process rather than a, a downward spiral, and then the banks will come want to come back in again because there'll be more business opportunities for them. But all seeded by a public bank that if you left it up to the private banks, they would never do it. But if you just start the process, like when the rains periodically hit the the interior of Australia, that looks like a desert, and every now and then when it rains, let a thousand flowers bloom. Right? That's what that's what can happen with with um. With the kind of credit that a public bank will be prepared to provide because it's not driven by a profit motive it's driven by the economic well-being of the country it creates opportunities for everybody and yet yeah, that's in our view that's how you that's the that's the foundation of how you reform the banking system and the financial system yeah and robbie it's worth saying isn't it that uh, a number of those senators have come out advocating alternative banking models of public bank of some sort, which is amazing really, because until quite recently, that was a very much uh, a, a non-discussion point, right? Because of course the idea was that um, you should leave the banking system to the final, to the private sector. And uh, of course the banking system are very big lobbyists. So up until quite recently, they were pulling all the strings behind the scenes. And suddenly we've got these senators who are now standing up and asking hard questions and talking about alternative models, which I think is really important. Another point to make well, is it, on the inquiry, Robbie, we've got more than, what, 600 submissions now? It's one of the most, um, uh, you know. Nice huge. Yeah. Just, um, and, and if you start reading those submissions, you can see that a lot of people have put a lot of time and trouble into their submissions, whether they're individuals, whether they're councils, whether they're businesses. But there's almost nobody arguing for the other side of the coin other than, of course, the um, the banking association. Yeah, I, I do want to show these, um, just to illustrate what you said, let me, I'll just share my screen to show this, some of this coverage that we've had about from this inquiry focusing on the, um, uh, the public bank idea or the people's bank. So this is a really excellent blog that's um, John Menadieu is uh is the former secretary of the department of prime minister and cabinet under gough whitlam and malcolm fraser and so this is read by professionals political professionals and retired political professionals in australia john menadieu lets me write for him periodically and he wanted me to cover this issue so this is something that we, we um that he published yesterday 
senators call for people's bank solution to regional bank closures because at the ingham hearing they did a they did a um press conference and there were five senators at the press conference three of them explicitly called for a public bank jared rennie is a is the um most consistent champion of a public bank in the australian parliament but he was backed up by malcolm roberts of one nation and senator um penny allman payne from the greens actually um who I quite admired her because she's a Green, she's a member of the Greens who's from Gladstone. And um, as a Queens, as someone from regional Queensland myself, I'm thinking, well, any Green who can survive in regional Queensland must be, um, uh, must have something going for her. <laughs> so, uh, and she was great, really, really good in the, um, in the hearings. And then you had this excellent coverage. This was, uh, what was that, 19th of May, so that's last week. Um, this was a lengthy ABC article based that I saw the journalists at the hearings. Um, so when it says mass ex exodus of regional bank branches across Australia's residents seeking solutions, uh, this is the this is the Westpac branch in Cloncurry, and that's the mayor of Westpac there, Greg Campbell. Um, uh, coming down here, the solution that they zeroed in on was public banking. Um, and this is a, this is a photo actually from the uh, the Ingham hearing, and so there's Malcolm Roberts, Senator Allman Payne, and and Jared Rennie from the Liberal Party, um, and they are the ones explicitly, you know, their view is look, now they're they're gonna they're gonna have a lot more hearings. Matt Canavan said they're gonna go to every state, but the way their talk is like this, they've already seen enough. They know that that a public bank is a really important solution, and don't rule out these two guys either. Um, the, the Nationals, Matt Canavan and, and uh, the Labor Party, uh, Senator Linda White there, um, because the evidence is all pointing to that. They're, 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 acknowledging, they're acknowledging that. So Jared's comment that they quoted here is, um, the banks, they're driven by the profit margin. That's fine, but we really need to look at a public bank. We have public hospitals, private hospitals. We have public schools and private schools. Why can't we have one public bank that acts as a backstop for both banking services and insurance services in the regions and across all of Australia? And um, I'm pretty sure that's a point you probably first made in an interview on one of your live shows, Mark, actually. Yeah, you did. Um, uh, and, and then um, Senator Allman Payne, we had a publicly owned bank, Commonwealth Bank. We saw that dismantled when the Labor government's, uh, when the Hawke Labor government turned towards neoliberalism. It's not good enough. We need regional communities to have better. Um, uh, so this is the theme that's emerging out of it, which is, uh, you know, the, which is why um, the Citizens Party got involved in this campaign, right? Because the our campaign for a public bank started first, um, and that 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 evolved and developed into the postal bank idea. And as we're fighting for the postal bank, we're seeing this phenomenon of of the post offices being exploited by the banks who are just pulling withdrawing their services. And and we think that this is the win-win solution, and it's because the Citizens Party campaigned so hard with you and with Dale that we are able to get up this inquiry, and now this is what pe everyone's starting to see it in these terms, which is really excellent. Uh, and just another example here. This was um, I, I, I find it remarkable. The the big radio stations in Australia are really on top of this issue. So they've been covering the um, the regional banking stuff a lot. When Westpac um, reversed its decision, I was on 6PR in Perth. They called me up and and uh, they wanted me on. They opened with congratulations because they acknowledged that you know the campaign for the that we've been part of was responsible for this. This is 3AW, which is the biggest one in Melbourne. Um, uh, Tom Elliott. Uh, the, the 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 drive host in the in the afternoons. He interviewed me on this, and he was really interested in the postal bank. And he told me in that interview that his father, John Elliott, the famous John Elliott, had actually been um, part of a consortium that was looking to to how you get to get a postal bank started, um, which is interesting. A lot of people have been thinking about this idea for a while. And it's all sort of all coming together as an as an achievable idea now. So there's just some there's just some examples. Of, of the of 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 this campaign driving people towards a solution. While I'm sharing my screen, I want to show people this though because this 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 erupted the other last week. Um, and I, as far as I'm concerned, this is the ball game. 
uh, in terms of our campaign about making the point that people need face-to-face banking services because CBA and NAB actually are now trying to order their staff in head office back to the office because head office staff got used, to, especially in the big cities like Sydney and Melbourne, got used to working from home and liked it better because they didn't have to com- commute and this has become an issue, right? Elon Musk famously took over Twitter and ordered all the staff back to the office, etc. But for CBA and NAB to be pushing this point, they're actually, what they they say it explicitly, face-to-face is very important. Yet they're the ones that are telling the public, the consumers, the retail customers, face-to-face is not important. You can do everything online. So they're completely undermining their own arguments when it's in their favour, when it's in their interest. Um, uh, and someone... Uh, to ex- someone, uh, Dale Webster, this is Dale, Dale tweets on the regional account here, um, someone observed to me that maybe a big part of the motivation of these banks in trying to force people back, I'll stop sharing now, force people back into the uh, into the office is because uh, they have to put too much stuff in writing and too much, there's too many opportunities for people to record Zoom calls uh, that they might want to amass evidence against their bosses or whatever, and there's too much opportunity for that, and so the banks are, trying, the banks are motivated to try and minimise that as much as possible so they can go back to a lot more verbal directions um, and, and leave less evidence around. <laughs> so who knows? I suspect there may be a kernel of truth in that there, though, but in doing so, the banks have undermined all their BS arguments against the... Um, uh, against uh, the need for bank branches. Yeah, absolutely, Robbie. And uh, there are going to be more hearings, I think, ahead. And uh, this is going to, I think, oh, It's going to every state, Matt. Yeah. Matt Kent, the chairman, announced it's going to every state. So, um, and if you, look, we'll keep watching, look at the Citizens Party's um, websites, you know, stay on top of this. Uh, we'll announce them ahead of time. If you're in the vicinity, come along. If you can, if you if you know there's a hearing, if you're in the regional area or whatever, there's a hearing in your town or, or somewhere close by, you can get to. I'm looking forward to a pretty big hearing in June in New South Wales at some stage. But come along, be, be part of the audience. Watch it. Watch this process in action. Yeah, and the points I wanted to make, Robbie, but this is democracy working, right? This is actually um, having set up the inquiry, and uh, you know, thanks to Dale and. Uh, and many other people were involved in getting it off and running. Now, here's an opportunity to um, drive it in the direction. And like I said at the top of the show, there's an alternative future that you can see here where banking works for households and businesses and actually uh, provides a base of funding to allow investment in um, Australia. Um, and that's a very different future from the one that the big banks are actually crafting their own minds and are imposing top down despite the political and economic and social consequences locally. Yep, absolutely. Great. Well, let's move on because I wanted just to uh, touch on a couple of other topics. I think we should briefly just touch on the ASIC inquiry, right? Because there's another inquiry. John Adams, of course, was um, very much involved in that. And and without going over all of the old ground, because, of course, there are some um, hearings being planned ahead, there are some missions there. But over the last week, John Adams actually, through a freedom of information request, really exposed the whole ASIC a relationship with government and the fact that ASIC is not interested in the truth, ASIC is interested in protecting itself. Yeah, and I think I think what I'd like the audience to reflect on here is that there's a... I won't say there's a new sheriff in town because we're not the sheriff, but um, there's an honest gunslinger who has ridden into town in the form of John Adams, your channel our party, our collaborators, um, we sort of came together, we all came together in 2018 when the Banking Royal Commission was on. And when you look at what happened before that, this is decades of, of absolutely unchecked financial corruption 
really great people trying to do stuff. Um, uh, Wacker Williams in the Senate did a lot of work. Um, Adele Ferguson did some really great work as a journo. You know, a friend of ours, Denise Braley, um, you know, as a, as a consumer advocate. And they had they got inquiries up. There was an ASIC inquiry in 2014, and then eventually they got up the, um, the Banking Royal Commission. But, but left to its own devices, you could – these things would have been just token things where a certain amount gets aired because the system has to absorb that, and then they go back to business as usual, Right. And that's what the, the, we've definitely witnessed post the Royal Commission, the, the the two major political parties geared to that default setting. We've got to get, you know, we've let them, we've let the wingers have their say. We'll go back to business as usual now, right? Well, what we have created through our collaboration is a new element, a new factor in the Australian body politic. We're constantly bringing the pub through these through these forums, through our shows, through our, our advocacy, we're, probably, we're constantly bringing as many eyeballs from the public as possible onto things that previously they would have missed because they would have been reported in a boring way in the financial review or not reported at all, et cetera, right? And um, John, is a, John Adams is a key guy because, um, uh, as we both appreciate, Martin, you know, because he's had experience in the building in one of the major parties in the Liberal Party. And I think when it comes to this ASIC campaign, uh, ASIC's never had to deal with anyone like him <laughs> uh, uh, because he's not, e even his complaint, now he's, has, he's got this thing he calls the package, this mysterious package, which I know what's in it, you know what's in it, but we're not allowed to talk about it, you know. Um, but we know enough to, to have confidence in John and his, mode, and his reasons for getting ASIC to investigate this, right? It's a major case of corporate fraud, corporate fraud that he achieved an ASIC investigation um, into. But in achieving it, John himself recognised that he was the exception that proves the rule because ASIC doesn't investigate hardly any of the complaints it receives, like um, less than 1%. John gave them a 650-page clearly worked out dossier of evidence the average Australian cannot match what John Adams was able to bring to the to the table on this. They just can't do it. ASIC had no choice but to investigate what he gave them. But since he got it up, and then he's and then he he, he got this Senate inquiry up with our support into um, into ASIC's failings of enforcement and and and, and uh, you know investigating so few complaints. It all was, it just started going really slow. It was a, you know, we were a little excited last November. We got not just one inquiry, but two. And then there's just been this go slow, right? So this has been driving John mad. And so he put in these freedom of information requests. And what he's discovered, what they eventually had to hand over is these are, these are emails between the ASIC staff because John's, what John asked for was basically, as only John can. Please provide me every bit of documentation related to any mention of me, <laughs> as in John. <laughs> um, he's my favourite narcissist. Anyway, he, that's a joke, John. Um, uh, but he, he did it for a reason because he knows that he's stirred them up. So what are they saying? Well, what they show they're saying is um, the most damning one is this email that says uh, uh, from, the, from the media people, they say, can we get up a Dorothy Dixer in the Senate hearing to give us an opportunity to slam this guy's report? Now, a Dorothy Dixer is the question you get a politician to ask, a staged question that gives you an opportunity, a friendly question that gives you an opportunity to present the spin you want to put on a subject. This is someone in ASIC revealing that ASIC has a habit of colluding with the senators on the committee that are the oversight of ASIC. That's this is absolute collusion. This is this should be completely intolerable, but this is there in black and white on an email. And so I'll just say as an aside, this goes to the the, the PW, you know, the PWC scandal was getting bigger by the day, what PWC did. But when you look at the details of what PwC did, what strikes me is that when they did it, they did it with absolute impunity. 
right? Because they they just thought they just considered themselves untouchable. Um, because this was this is far more normal in the Australian financial system for a long time than people even talking about the scandal today want to admit to. But that's just the way it was. And what and this ASIC thing that John has show, exposed through freedom of information shows that this, as I, I, I did it on our show, we called it the Canberra way, financial corruption of the Canberra way, like the what the notorious Chicago way under Al Capone. This is this is too much a feature of the system. This is standard operating procedure in Australia. And it's why things have gone on as badly as they have for so long. Um, it's why Australia is described as a paradise for white collar crime. But now we're talking about it. It's coming out and it can't be swept under the carpet. And as it's come out, it's come out exactly the same time as this PwC scandal, which itself can't be swept under the carpet, which is exploding. It's huge. You might have some, you know, Martin worked in the um, one of the big accounting firms. He has some insight into these things. Um, uh, but I think in, I think the arrogance of these people is an arrogance born of conditioning that they've they they are untouchable. They've got away with this sort of stuff for so long, and now they're not getting away with it. And the reason that and one of the reasons I want to, don't want to take all the credit, but one of the reasons they're not is that this process we're part of now, where there's a there's a there's a growing collaboration with people and, and organisations like ours and the Citizens Party um, to keep focusing on these issues and keep bringing them to light and it's it's helping to shift the system it's helping to change the system or, or at least lead to the initial airing that can lead to the changing of the system that's uh, yeah and i think hats off to john and the process you know we 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 played a direct a, a role um a bit earlier in that when we when when we also took on asic with on the on behalf of the sterling first victims in western australia um, and that helped feed into what John John's doing now with ASIC, and it's a it's a growing and evolving process. It's and now it's it's at the snowballing stage. Yeah, and just to say that the whole point about the ASIC um, questions is an assumption that many people will have that ASIC is actually the cop on the beat and protecting them from an investment uh, scam, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The truth is they are not really up to it. They only explore a very small number of cases. And they do seem to be rather more aligned with the big end of town rather than individuals or small businesses. And they also um, are very aligned to the political environment. And as the FOI shows, you know, they were more interested in protecting their own situation, their own back. And uh, in fact, one of the other things the FIs showed was a senior person from ASIC saying, it'd be really nice if John's package just disappeared you know they weren't really wanting to take it seriously and that's a problem and, and, and i guess robbie the question i have and nobody knows but to what extent is what we're seeing in the context of asset true in the other regulatory environments that actually also are connected to uh, our politicians you know be that the rba be that um uh, yep. APRA. my feeling is that this is actually shining a light on the very core essence of the way that politics and big business and the regulators, frankly, are all on the same side of the balance sheet over and against ordinary Australians and ordinary businesses. Well, as George Carlin said, it's a great big club and you are not in it. And <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a disease born of neoliberalism, born of this idea that... Um, the only people qualified to deal, to to make the real decisions that that um, drive the economy forward are in the private sector. Um, governments have to vacate the field and let that happen so that the, the, the necessary government structures that everyone could, that no one could deny had to exist, they had to be biased towards the, the, um, the corporations that they actually had they actually had to adopt a bias towards them, right? We're here to be business friendly. Uh, was it Tony Abbott when he got elected? We're open for business, right? We're business friendly. Um, Joe Longo, the current chairman of ASIC, the, the Finance Review uh, described him when he got appointed in 2021. He said the Finance Review described. He is the business-friendly regulator Josh Frydenberg craves. Josh Frydenberg was the treasurer at the time. Um, 
and that became the standard. Whereas if you actually um, size this whole mess up, you'd go, no, no, you need some, you need some, um, uh, uh, what do you call them? You need some um, crusaders in there. You need people who are going to bring this system to heal. You need people who are going to say, no, yeah, you're, you're a legitimate business if you're an honest business, right? And if you're not an honest business, you're going to be scared of us. You need that kind of you need that kind of mentality. You need to close the revolving door between the regulators and the banks and the insurance companies. You need to you need to take all this sort of stuff on um, because it's too much of a disease. Otherwise, that you'll never unpack. Even I mean, even get this: Chris Jordan, who's the head of the Australian Tax Office, and I'm not saying anything about his character. But he's a head of the Australian Tax Office and he's a former partner of PwC. And it's PwC partners who ripped off the tax office in this 2014 scandal. And he's the guy. Now, he claimed today in the Senate he actually referred it in 2018 to the federal police and nothing was done. And that's and if, if that's true, actually, I don't, sorry, he said the ATO. Did. I, actually, I, don't, I actually don't remember how long he's been in that job. But nevertheless... Um, he might be perfectly innocent, but because he's got the same stain on him as the the brand of this company that's that this, that's in so much trouble, it looks bad. And but we're used to this. This is like par for the course, you know. Or that this is how it's done. Well, no, no. Um, we've got to go back to a different way of doing it. You know, if you don't have these kind of conflicts of interest. You've got to clean them out. Absolutely. That's right. And uh, the truth is that um, it goes back to this point. There's an alternative future where things work differently, but you have to actually understand how things currently work before we can actually move on to, to, to change and transform them. And uh, once again, shining the spotlight is the, the, the critical point. And just quickly on um, the big accounting firms. Sure, I worked for one of them years ago. I was horrified um, having worked in a boutique strategy organization for a good number of years, I moved across to one of the old large accounting firms. And it was like moving into a completely different culture because everyone really was motivated just by, you know, doing whatever they could to, to make a buck. And uh, I often say many of the partners there, they do anything, just they'd sell their grandmother. Um, ethics and, and truth were not on the agenda. And I found that pretty amazing and then you know, quite quickly that one yeah. fell over. Um, but it goes back to the critical question, the relationship between the large accounting firms and government and the regulation. And unfortunately, again, it's all stacked on the wrong side of the deck. Um, it's not actually doing what it should be doing. And uh, there are an implicit set of rules, you know, the mates conversations um, that actually are describing how things really work rather than the way you would like them to work. And remember, the big, the big four accounting firms is actually a bigger problem than the big four banks because they're, big, they're the big four globally, worldwide big four. And um, they signed off on all, all the big banking crashes in the last couple of decades Every single one of those big banks that went under was signed off on. Their books were signed off on by one of these big four accounting firms. Um, and when this has been looked at, people are shaking their head and thinking, why Why is this allowed to be um, like this? And then they have a, they, they're not just accounting firms, they're consulting firms. And so they're often auditing firms who they're also making money consulting to. And it's a gross conflict of interest. That everyone knows exists and no one's done anything about it. That's why there's now again renewed calls to break them up. Right, they shouldn't be allowed to do um, both functions. But in 2019, um, Martin, you and I worked together on. We we got Bob Catter to introduce a bill into Parliament calling for a the Auditor General of Australia, the government auditor, to audit the big four banks instead of the big four accounting firms because we had no confidence that you could trust in the what's in the books of the big four banks based on the audits of the big four accounting firms. So get the government ordered to do it. That's what our bill called for. We got that introduced in the parliament. And there, it coincided with a Senate inquiry then 
into the auditing industry. And um, Deb O'Neill, who's she's a prominent person in this PwC scandal, she's really prosecuting it. She was part of that inquiry, but that was chaired by the Liberals. Um, I remember I sat on a hearing in 2019. Uh, and that's when that's when the bushfires were on and Canberra was covered in smoke. But I sat in on this hearing and Senator Peter Wish Wilson from the Greens, he asked the same question all day. And he, the question he kept asking every new witness who came forward, it says, who audits the auditors? And there's no answer because no one does. So here's your, here you got, and think about what this means for the structural integrity of the global financial system. You got this, these four firms that are so dominant in auditing the banks that are the engine of the global financial system, yet no, they're, they're riddled with conflicts of interest. They're full of crooks like the PwC scandal is showing, and nobody gets to check on them. And therein lies the problem with the world. Why, why we're in this global systemic financial crisis. Yeah, absolutely. And I've said a few times that uh, the capital models that uh, the banks are using internally, um, you know, are sort of looked over by those accounting firms. But the question is, are they seriously looked at? Are they, you know, are they fit for purpose? My own feeling is probably not. Now, Robbie, we've... Um, to be sorry, go on. I, I, yeah, not if they're to be to fail. How can they be seriously looked at? You know, and that's the thing. No. Yeah, yeah. they'll get bailed out. But anyway, let's. We should probably move on. Yeah, exactly. Well, I was going to say we've pretty much um, hit our sort of stop. But one more su subject briefly, because there's a very important vibe out internationally, and unfortunately, it's about the whole question of you know war. That war is coming. We need to prepare for it, etc., etc., etc. And I get more and more worried every time I hear this because it seems to me that there is a an agenda being prosecuted here, which again is frankly myopic, one-sided. And unfortunately, Australia is being, well, either shepherded or sucked in, whichever how you look at it, into a set of agendas which are frankly very disturbing. Yep. Yeah, um, but now I want to, I'm, I'm assuming that some of the, the uh, audience tonight, um, Martin, will be your regulars. And they would be very familiar with my views on this. And I want them to acknowledge privately to themselves or even in the chat that when they heard Paul Keating take to the National Press Club in March, I, ho I hope some of them thought, hang on, he sound he's sounding like Robbie Barwick. <laughs> um, and I want to highlight Keating because he wasn't – Keating, whatever you think of Keating um, – and I, I never thought I'd actually say good things about him, but um, Keating is talking a certain generational view. And that that website I showed before, John Menadou's Pearls and Irritation, is it, all its contributors reflect the same generational view. This was a this was an older generation of Australians who had a distinctly different idea of Australian sovereignty to what prevails today. They would never have contemplated where this is going, and. I was introduced to that generation through my acquaintance with Malcolm Fraser. Um, and I got to work closely with Malcolm Fraser in his final years. And he wrote this really excellent book, Dangerous Allies. And it had a, it had a killer kicker. He said, it said his kicker was uh, Australia needs the United States for security. Australia needs the US alliance for security. But Australia only needs its alliance with the United States. With sorry, Australia only needs security because of its alliance with the United States, because that alliance has drawn us into war after war after war. We're sorry, we have become the bad guys on the world stage because we are the ones that are talking about war. The other side isn't trying to talk about war. We're talking ourselves into this. And not for not because it's any interest. It's in Australia's interest, but the people that are, that are um, especially running the United States at the moment, but also running the United Kingdom. Paul Keating was right to call them out. They're trying to build them. The, 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 the silly Brits are trying to build themselves up as the Empire 2.0, Global Britain. They call it um, uh, re recreating. You know, and, and just listen to them talk. 
Listen to this current crop of British politicians in, in, the, in the Tory party in power. They're lunatics, absolute lunatics. But they're, they're resonating with equally crazy American congressmen and they are certifiably nuts. They've, there's a wave of McCarthyism. Now, when, you, when we were all growing up, you would have heard about McCarthyism at school and you would have heard the consensus that it was, a, it was an era of derangement. Freaking Marilyn Monroe's boyfriend wrote a play called The Crucible set in the Salem witchcraft trial so he could get Americans of his era in the 50s to reflect on how freaking nuts they'd gone. That they had that the that the McCart the anti-China witch hunts in the 50s were replicating the, the craziest chapter of American history, the Salem Witchcraft Trials. That's why he wrote that part play. And he was so smart, he was Marilyn Monroe's boyfriend. Um everyone knows that was a bad chapter. Well, it's back, baby. It's back on steroids. There's a punk in the federal parliament called Senator James Patterson. He wants you to believe that everything that moves is a Chinese spy. A phone, a camera, a drone. The the Australian government, the Australian army has drones, personal drones. All they are is drones, just personal ones. But they use them for things like with doing when they're doing war games. You know, get a high vantage point, put a mobile phone on there, and feed it back to a camera. Suddenly, that's all spying equipment. The army said, no, it's not. They signed on this off on this two years ago. It was a done. It was a very deal, but because that punk gets up in Parliament and rants and raves about them, re, you know, repeating what his American controllers are telling him to say, um, suddenly the army professionals who know a damn sight more than that thirty-five-year-old about this stuff, they're supposed to take it all seriously. Oh yeah, well we better we better not use these drones anymore because a thirty-five-year-old baby in Parliament tells us they're spying for China. There are congressmen in America who go to the docks and do press conferences in front of cranes that li- whose only job is to take shipping containers off the backs of ships and put them on trucks, and those cranes are spying for China. This is deranged. These people have lost their freaking minds, and they are controlling our foreign policy. Now, I'm very happy that there's a, there's a pushback now, the kind of things that for a while there, you, you know as well as only Martin, the, the Citizens Party was the only voice saying this, now there's a shift. Paul Keating did us all a huge favour by expressing it in the same terms as me, um, uh, but not because he's copying me. I'm not claiming credit for that. This is because from where he sees the world, he sees he sees exactly what we in the Citizens Party um, have seen and where this is going. Because never forget, 20 years ago this year, the world watched as the most powerful country on earth, probably in the history of the world, talked itself into a war. And it's like watching a person, a, a really powerful person with lots of weapons having a mental episode where you're powerless to intervene because you know that if you go close to it, he's likely to kill you on the spot just out of mental derangement. That's what we saw 20 years ago. We saw an American propaganda machine colluding with the British government talk themselves into a war and prepare to kill a million people. And what the and and the world was like, whoa. And then they did it again. They did it again. And they set up a dynamic where they forced the rest of the world to start taking um measures against them. But why are they why are that why why is it so dangerous now? Well, it's so dangerous now because there's another thing going on. The Americans got so um, uh, arrogant in their in their belief that they should remain the world's sole superpower. They used the only civil weapon they had, which is the US dollar, way too much. They would sanction anything and everything that moved. Uh, sanction this, they can sanction that, they can sanction the other. And Vladimir Putin warned them years, quite a few years ago. Um, Martin, Putin warned them, if you want to retain value in your currency, stop undermining it by using it as a weapon against everybody you don't like. But they didn't stop. And what you're seeing now is a de-dollarization process. Countries are looking for every chance they can get to get off the American dollar, get away from that 
control mechanism to the American government. That's what's made um, and 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 China, which didn't go and fight these wars, that has been in, that has done nothing except defensive actions against the American provocations, including in their part of the world, in the South China Sea. It was the Americans who moved their military in in, in 2011 first in the Asia pivot. Then China started building up the islands and all those things you hear about that's called Chinese aggression and Chinese expansionism. These are all defensive measures because they've seen this greater and greater array of where American weaponry against them. Um, China got on with economic stuff. And, and with the BRICS, formed the BRICS, and the whole world is starting to gravitate to the BRICS. This is such a powerful impulse now where two implacable enemies in the Middle East um, Saudi Arabia and Iran, and I mean implacable enemies, not only did they do a peace deal brokered by China, but they're both applied to join the BRICS because they see that their interest in that going in that direction economically, their shared interest is greater than their historical enmity against each other. And so the Americans and the Brits are looking at this and they're getting more crazy. They're getting more frantic because nothing they're doing is working. They're not asserting any sense of keeping, they want to They want to assert their position as the world's sole superpower and it's crumbling away under their feet. And so the crazies in the Congress and in, the, and in Westminster are getting crazier. And that's what's making this situation so dangerous. That's why they're normalising the talk for war. And in Australia, it's a mixed bag. It's, it's, it's schizophrenic. Thank God, you know, um, there is an impulse in the Albanese government to stabilise the relationship with China because that's good. Um, and every time there's a there's a there's a um, an improvement in the trade relationship, everyone's celebrating that, and I'm glad to see that. Um, you know, the Labor Party has to; they can't dismiss what Paul Keating said, and so this has become a factor, and I think that's great. But on the other hand, they are so wedded to this obsequious relationship to the Brits in the UK. The, the the dangerous allies that, that Malcolm Fraser called them, where they are they are doing things that previous generations would never have done. They've turned Australia into a, an unsinkable aircraft carrier for the United States. They've twisted themselves in knots to justify B-52s that probably have nuclear weapons in them being able to be based in Australia against our own treaties. And what's the what's the uh questions of of Penny Wong? In um, Senate estimates for that, every demand the Americans are making on them, they're um, they're acceding to, and so for every step forward towards something that is more peaceful with China, you've got this continued escalation. And the big one, and I'll end on this, so I don't want to go too long because I know we're over time. But the big one is um, the people in the United States who, in the U.S. Congress, who are w- without with no thought of the consequences are hell-bent on encouraging the Taiwanese to declare independence. And in fact, it's far more crazy in the United States than in Taiwan. The Taiwanese themselves, the Democratic Party is on the nose, the Nationalist Party that actually was on track for a peaceful reunification with China is in the ascendancy. The Taiwanese people are paying attention to this talk and they do not want crazy American politicians to um, uh, uh, provoke a war on their behalf. Um, but there is an element in Taiwan that's that's working with the United States and, and um, that, that around the Democratic Party that actually pays lip service to this idea of independence, and that's China's red line. And don't take my word for it. I'm quoting, I'm quoting the best American experts on this. I'm quoting people like Chaz Freeman. Look him up on YouTube, Chaz Freeman. The guy who was there when Henry Kissinger negotiated with Zhao and Lai, and he was his, he was the translator. That guy, listen to his analysis. Top American thinkers who are, who have watched this all along, they know how crazy their country has got, right? Where America is, is getting right up in China's face and saying, we define China, we define Taiwan as our sphere of influence. And that is, there's only one red line the Chinese have, and that's that one. And so that's going to be the trigger for war, that thing. And the Americans are assuming if they if that war happens, Australia will just be a base for them to 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 um uh, uh to fight that war from. 
with nuclear submarines, nuclear equipped bombers, etc. Um, and then then you'll be glad, Martin, that you got out of Wollongong because Port Kembla, Port Kembla, I can tell you, I know, I have sources, highly placed sources, credible ones, who you know as well, um, I'll say that much, who have confirmed that is the main base that's being looked at for the submarines. And that means there's someone in China who's had to put a big red target around Wollongong. And if there's a war, there's a missile going to go hit that freaking city. That's what, it's just going to happen. It's not the time, it's not out of hatred by the Chinese. That's what's going to happen. That's what we have talked, this is so far advanced, it is nuts. If you were afraid, be afraid. But be grateful that someone like Paul Keating spoken out that there is a pushback and the, that the work our party has done for a long time is actually being resonating more and more and more. Yeah, Robbie. And, uh, you know, with all of these things, the point to make is there's a lot more going on below the surface than you get reported in the mainstream. And it's really important that people actually have a little bit more objectivity about what's going on rather than just... Um, well, being sort of shuffled down the road and say, well, it's all too complex and we'll leave other people to worry about it. This is important stuff because it goes back to the purpose of this show, right, which was to say there are some important decisions which will determine the future. And depending on the nature of those decisions, we can end up with a, a society and a country that's actually um, good for its citizens and good for its businesses. Or we can end up yep. with a country that's, locked and destroyed and uh, you know whilst the 10 percent will be fine or the one percent will be enjoying the assets that they've managed to create everybody else will be really struggling so these are really critical issues and um hopefully we've right. explored some of those things a little bit tonight and, and martin i just want to end this china subject with an interesting little um uh anecdote so for, uh, a friend of mine uh, died last week, Tony Pung, who's a leader of the Chinese community in Australia. And um, as I was able to say on our show, our, Tony Pung was probably the first person in the Chinese community, like a, any, any kind of organised Chinese community that I ever met. This was this was only a few years ago because our party has never done this to pander to the Chinese community for votes or anything like that. We haven't, you know, Robbie Barwick is, is funded by the CCP. It's all, it's all been garbage, right, utter garbage. Robbie Barwick is funded by Australian citizens who funded the Citizens Party. Um, and we're the most democratically funded party in Australia. We don't take money from anybody except Australian citizens and not from corporations, et cetera. Anyway, that's an aside. Tony died and... Um, uh, he was a really brilliant guy. He was the chief, former chief scientist at St Vincent's Hospital. He was a leader of the Ethnic Communities Council. He's the guy who got Bob Hawke to allow more Chinese people to stay um, after the Tiananmen Square incident. Um, and he's quite a legend in, in Chinese community circles. First time I met Tony, um, he was we were at a Chinese restaurant with a group of other guys, and they told me a story that really took me aback. And well, it was a, it was a they gave me an insight into China. This was. And, and the, what they told me was there's a there's always been a tradition in China where the businessman has not been allowed to be involved in politics. The businessman has not been allowed to be because the businessman is is motivated by profit. This is an this is not a communist thing. This is Chinese culture going back centuries and centuries. The businessman's not been allowed to be involved in politics. Now the other day, Ray Dalio, the American financier who's also concerned about this very subject. He, I, I saw a, a LinkedIn post he made, and he knows China very well, and he was talking China to both sides in a sense, but giving a fellow Americans an insight of someone who knows China very well. He repeated the same point. That's something that he's picked up about China. This tradition, the businessman has not been allowed to be involved in politics. And what that means is China is not a plutocracy. And in a practical sense, I'll give you an example of it. China's banks. China's banks, there's, it's got four or five big state banks controlled by the Chinese government. The banks and corporations in China don't tell the Chinese government what to do. The Chinese government tells them what to do. And then that becomes a human rights issue outside of China. Oh, oh, those poor corporations in China, they've got to do what the Chinese government says. As if our model and the American model of the government being here and the corporations being above the government and dictating to it is better. But I'm saying that because... 
China is what China has done with its banks under state control that have invested in the things that China needs has been incredibly successful, and that's what's attracted all these financial uh, economic um, co- uh, cooperators around the world to want to be part of that, and it's become a very successful model. That, in my view, that is what's at the heart of this conflict because it's a battle of two systems. And this is not communism versus capitalism because what we're talking about is not even capitalism. We have become so corrupted in the West. We've, be- we've become so um, morally and ethically degenerate when it comes to financial systems. Everything we've talked about today in, in this show up to this point, all those things we're talking about, we've, we've come to accept as normal. Well, countries like China have never been able to operate that way. And what they've done is show a different model where you can use state banks to invest in the, and create the framework. Yeah, let, have, let private enterprise flourish, encourage entrepreneurs, but they don't run the show. The welfare of the people comes first, and that's the government's responsibility. And that, Wall, Wall Street dictates to the American Congress. The City of London dictates to the British Parliament. They represent the opposite system. That's what's coming to a head here. That's what's driving, that's what's the fundamental thing driving this animosity that will drive us to World War III and total annihilation. And so what we've been doing in for the rest of this program that we've talked about, all those things, it's all part of the push for peace. This is we are the, the future that we want to create is one that's going to be in more harmony with the rest of the world who want a decent future than what we've chained ourselves to in this five eyes corrupted relationship with the you know anglo-american centered banking system and i think it's an important perspective to have as we think this stuff through it's not saying one system is perfect and the others it's not but one system is so much better than the other and it's so much more um, accountable to the real people um, and the results are on the board and people should look at it from that standpoint yeah, right. Thank you very much for that. And uh, that's the, really the whole point about these shows is to try and give people different perspectives and to, uh, you know, question some of the things which perhaps they've taken as uh, an assumed truth, because often truth and reality are not necessarily as uh, aligned as perhaps some people would want to see. So I want to say thanks for spending some time with us, Robbie, tonight. Really appreciate it. If people want to find out more about what you do, where is the best place for them to go? Uh, citizensparty.org.au and um, subscribe to the Citizens Report on YouTube. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, Robbie. I and appreciate you, that. And if, really, and if you're really keen, like if you're, if you're in a hurry to get more information, we've got a toll-free number, 1-800-636-432. You can give it a call tomorrow and um, ask for any literature to back up what I've been saying. Thank you, Robbie. Well, appreciate that. Thanks for your time tonight. And uh, I'm Thanks, going Mark. to close the show. Um, you may have heard a few doggy noises off. Um, hang on a moment. Come here. There we are. For those who follow the doggy cam, Meteor is here in the UK now. And uh, she's decided that it's really time for lunch. So she's been giving me hurry ups for the last um half an hour or so. But anyway, I want to say thank you very much for uh, spending some time with us this evening. Next week, um, it'll be Damien Classen and we'll be talking about the market and what's going on. Thank you very much for following the conversation tonight and uh, check out our other shows over the next few days. And uh, we'll be back uh, this time next week. And thanks once again to Robbie. This is Martin North from Digital Finance and the Lids signing off. Cheerio.